Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a great day. My name is Karen Doyle, Operations Director of CTAM Europe. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar with our partners, Strategy Analytics. I'm pleased to introduce David Watkins, who's VP Media and then Intelligent Home, and Michael Goodman, Director of TV and Media Strategies. Today's title is why connected TV platforms are the future of TV. I've had a preview of the slide, so I can tell you it's going to be a great session. We're due to last around 45 minutes, which will include time for a good Q&A session at the end. So please do get involved and post your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. As always, the recording of this presentation will be posted on the members only section of ctamurope.com. If you're not a current member, we'd love for you to join us. So please email info at ctamurope.com for members details on how to sign up. Members have access to two webinars a month, an annual symposium, hopefully live this year, along with webinars and monthly podcasts from our colleagues at CTAM US. Our flagship programme is the fantastic week-long executive management programme at INSEAD. It took place at INSEAD last week after two long COVID years, and we finally got to welcome our class of 22 live at INSEAD. Dates are still to be confirmed for next year, but it's looking likely to be springtime. I'll follow up in an email in the next day or so, and also your details will be shared with Strategy Analytics, who may in turn follow up with you. So for now, I'll take myself off screen and turn the stage over to David and Michael. Thank you. That's great. Many thanks, Karen. Um, so yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, many thanks for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, and again, many thanks to Karen and the, the team at uh, CTAM Europe for, for giving us the opportunity to, to talk to you today about um, connected TV platforms. Are they the future of TV? Which I'm sure uh, most of you agree is, is one of the hottest topics uh, in, the, in the TV industry today. Um, as Karen mentioned, um, please feel free to ask questions via the Q&A tool. tool. Um, we'll try and get to them as we go along, um, but certainly build in some time at the end to, to address them. Um, so by way of introduction, my name's David Watkins. Um, I lead the media and intelligent home uh, practice at Strategy Analytics. For those of you who uh, are not aware of who we are, we're uh, a global research consultancy um, that supports many of the world's uh, leading players across the uh, consumer media, devices, uh, and services industries. Um, and my team, as uh, the following slide um, rather busily aims to highlight, uh, is really focused on uh, helping companies to define uh, and develop opportunities in residential uh, businesses, uh, as well as understand the choices uh, that, that customers are making. So I'm joined today uh, on today's webinar by my colleague, Mike Goodman. Uh, Mike leads our TV and video uh, research program. Uh, I'll pass over to Mike now to uh, say a few words of introduction and, and also to get things kicked off. Thank you, David. As David said, I head up our TV and media strategies practice, where I like to say that, that our focus is about how technology is changing the production, distribution, consumption, monetization of media entertainment. Um, well, when we think about what's happening in, in television, that we're, we're in the midst of a transformation of the television ecosystem. If we think back to maybe a decade ago, it was really a closed system. And what I mean by that is that it was, first of all, consumers had a binary, it was essentially, a, it was more or less a binary equation. They either paid for multi-channel television or they didn't. Um, and they didn't have a lot of choices as to how they were gonna get this. You either subscribed to a paid TV service or you didn't. On the flip side of that, um, if you if you were a programmer, if you were a content owner, yes, you could it, you had digital terrestrial, but but from the pay TV environment, you had if you wanted to reach the consumer, you had to go through a pay TV provider. It was much more difficult to get there, and and in many ways, it was much more of a one sided relationship. If we fast forward to today, um, we're seeing the transformation in the marketplace, um, and that we have a host of alternative platforms with which we can access. The catalyst for all of this was the internet, or if we want to, or if we more 
commonly called today the cloud. But, but regardless of what we say, this has created an opportunity for a variety of platforms to reach the consumer. Instead of just going through pay TV providers, yes, we still have pay TV providers, but we have the connected TV, we have connected TV platforms, um, which we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today. We have third party websites such as Netflix to go directly. And we have content owner websites such as is Disney Plus um, to, uh, to be able to, to get content from. And this cre has created a whole host of new ways that are competing. So it's not, it's, it's a really, I would describe it as a hybrid system. It's not a, a completely open system because we still have platforms to go through, um, connected TVs, et cetera, um, to go through, but it's a much more open system um, and it changes the relationships between programmers and and the platforms and the consumers when choice is, invo is involved here. Yeah, thanks, Mai. I think just, just following up on that and sort of thinking a little bit about um, how the evolution of, of devices has helped shape this, this new TV viewing paradigm, we, we perhaps mustn't forget that um, traditional TV players um, didn't really see any threat from uh, internet video uh, as it emerged back in the back in the early 2000s. Most in internet video in those days was was um, was delivered to PCs, was consumed on PCs, uh, and this wasn't really seen as a threat to the to the TV viewing experience. I guess you had some sort of tech savvy folk who would hook their PC up to their TV, uh, but but that that behaviour clearly wasn't wasn't widespread. Then we had sort of game console vendors uh, starting to add internet connectivity to their devices. Um, game consoles became viable internet video platforms uh, in themselves, but you know, naturally you know, usage of those devices was skewed towards wood gaming applications. So it wasn't really till around the 2010 period that TVs themselves uh, added internet connectivity. Um, there had been a bit of experimentation, of course, before this time. Um, however, those early smart TVs that did emerge um, were hindered by um, unreliable and, or, or non-existent Wi-Fi, uh, clunky interfaces, uh, limited content, and, and relatively low usage. Um, we did see, of course, separate streaming boxes, streaming sticks um, emerge around this time, the likes of Roku, the Roku Player, the likes of Google Chromecast. Uh, which appeared as popular, cheaper alternatives and, and, and still remain popular to this day, of course. But really over the last five years, we've seen smart TVs evolve into much more competitive platforms with, with very stable, regularly updated operating systems, much better designed user interfaces, much more sophisticated uh, search and navigation tools. And, and ownership has, of smart TVs has, has grown accordingly. So back in 2015, uh, our data suggests that uh, Western European ownership of smart TVs was down at around 25% of homes. Uh, fast forward to 2021, that's risen to beyond 60%. And by the middle of the decade, we, we expect that to go beyond 80%. So really becoming uh, standard in terms of the, the, the sales of TVs out there and, and the majority of households now owning one. So it's only really been in recent years that traditional TV players have kind of started to recognize the threat um, posed by these new access points. And many pay TV and free-to-air providers are now starting to, I guess, move rapidly to uh, adopt and add third-party streaming services to their set-top boxes as they attempt to maintain um, their role as, as aggregators of choice. Uh, and in, in some, some respects, we're starting to see some examples of these, these traditional pay TV operators taking control of the streaming platform technologies as well. And we'll, we'll come to that a little bit later. So as we can see, and as Mike's described, the TV ecosystem has changed dramatically uh, over the last couple of decades. And at the same time, so as consumer behaviors and, and consumer attitudes when it comes to viewing TV and video content. And Mike, you're going to take us a little bit through uh, some of the, that change in attitude as well. 
Yeah. So I think, I think that's an important point is that consumers opinions are evolving. This data comes from a recent survey that um, Strategy Analytics has conducted. Um, we actually conducted in, in the US, the UK and in China. Um, for the moment, we're just going to look at the, the UK data here. And, and I think that some of the things that we can take, a, take away from this is that when we ask people about traditional television, that, that less than half of, of those that we that were surveyed said that they thought that they value um, the convenience and simplicity of television. That um, and I think in, to a certain degree, a little bit more alarming is when we think about the value proposition of, of video entertainment. Only about a third of the people say that that the entertainment, that the video entertainment that they're watching is worth the price, and that. That spending money on video entertainment is, is well worth it. it uh, you know, particularly during the pandemic, you would think that these numbers would be a lot higher. Um, so clearly, it shows that there are there are opportunities for these new services to come in because many of the traditional services that we're seeing already um, are. Um, that, that consumers do not have the same degree of loyalty to these that they might have in previous years. So, so legacy. So, so an important takeaway is that legacy services are going to continue to feel pressure from these cloud-based TV services. But I also think something else that's important to recognize here, as all of these services come on, and it comes and it applies directly to what David was just talking about, about these platform, these emerging platforms from television manufacturers and streaming set top boxes, et cetera. One of the most important things ultimately is getting onto the television set. Despite the growth of, of consumption of mobile video and other things, particularly when it comes to high value entertainment, um, people wanna watch it on the big screen. So, so if we use Netflix as an example here, um, according to Netflix, 70% of video um, is consumed on the television, irregardless of where they may have signed up and where they may have started viewing, whether it's mobile or a tablet or a PC, um, about six months in, 70% of that is consumed on the TV. And that's overall. Um, not surprisingly, that when we look at different countries, the the consumption on TV will vary. So in, in Italy, it's 54%, in Poland, 49%. Um, down in South America, in Colombia, it jumps all the way up to, to 69%. What also stands out a little bit to me is in Southeast Asia, Thailand is only 35%. But when we think about it, um, that particularly in Southeast Asia and in less developed countries, mobile is, is such a um, a prevalent platform there and, and so much OTT video, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is actually consumed on mobile devices. It becomes, Southeast Asia becomes a little bit of an outlier. Also the fact that fewer people um, in, in Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asian countries and developing countries are less likely to have television sets than in developed countries. But all what this all this, all this leads to um, is a a changing marketplace. And we can see how that's changing in the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think, I think um, you know, when we, we think about this shift then um, from streaming, from, from uh, to streaming TV, from uh, legacy TV, um, and if we think about it in terms of a timeline, we can perhaps think about four um, distinct phases of development. Um, although of course, where we are along this timeline, depends on which market we're talking about. I think if we think about advanced markets, um, you know, the trial phase, as we call it here, began back in the, in the early 2000s, as we've talked about with low quality streams, clunky device setups. The rollout phase um, began around the time that Netflix and BBC's iPlayer um, started to become uh, widely available. So here we're talking about the late 2000s, early 2010s. But as we've we've already kind of discussed, they had little impact on um, on traditional TV at the time. Um, the past few years, we've been going what we call through what we call the the attack phase. So here um, we've seen streaming providers uh, developing targeted content strategies, including the development of of, of their own original programming, uh, and, and most importantly, smart TVs. Uh, and, and other connected devices have been enabled um, with, with easy to use, uh, ready to go streaming platforms. 
So we would argue now that we're, we're moving into what we're calling the, the substitu substitution phase, which is when streaming becomes uh, um, the preferred option uh, for a growing number of, of, of TV viewers. Uh, and as a consequence, we're seeing both content providers, we're seeing uh, advertisers uh, moving uh, connected TV to the top of their priority list. Uh, and it's often that these new streaming platforms are, are leading the way in terms of the evolution of the of the TV experience. So I guess what everyone's trying now to 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 work out is well, what does this post legacy uh, TV landscape look like? Will we see complete substitution? Uh, will traditional broadcast models like cable, cable satellite, IPTV, will they uh, maintain a foothold in, in the market? Um, I guess much will depend on, on, on regulation, of course, uh, and policy in different countries. Um, but clearly, we're starting to see moves from uh, traditional players to partner with uh, OTT providers like, like Netflix and Disney. Um, and for, for many, it's, it's, I guess, for many commentators in the market, for many people in the industry, it's, it's only a question of time uh, when they will switch over to, to full uh, OTT operations and, and away from these, these managed uh, network services. So I guess conceptually, we can see how streaming TV is becoming uh, the dominant force in, in modern TV. Um, but how does that look in terms of actual consumer revenues? How does that look in terms of actual uh, subscription numbers? Um, Mike's going to talk a little bit more about and give some color around um, what we're seeing in terms of those numbers. Yeah, so, so as we move away from, from sort of the conceptual or theoretical conversation and, and actually into the real world, how is this starting to, to impact um, various um, parts of the ecosystem? So, so first of all, let's start out just by, by defining some terms here, just so that we're all on the same page. So historically, we've called pay TV, cable, satellite, IPTV, pay digital, terrestrial. We now define that as legacy pay TV services. And pay TV services, now we add in those OTT pay TV services or virtual MPVs. I think a really good example of that is um, Nordic Entertainment Group's um, Via Play is a great example of that. But more importantly, is, is I would argue, is that last category there, and that's what I call subscription TV. And this includes the SVOD services in there as well. And the reason why I think it's so important that we change this definition and begin to think about subscription television is because there, there's really, there's two constants in people's lives, time and money. And so when we're talking about subscription TV and we're adding those SVOD services in there, when we're adding the Netflix and the Amazon Primes and the Disney's in there, it's about wallet share and it's about mind share and time share. Um, and there's only so many of these things and these are the trade-offs that consumers are starting to make. You know, it was either, it used to be a historically, um, a, as I mentioned earlier, a binary equation. I either chose to subscribe to and pay for um, pay television or I didn't. It wasn't. I didn't. It wasn't a function of well. I'm going to check. I'm going to subscribe to pay television, and I'm going to subscribe to Disney, and I'm going to subscribe to Netflix. I didn't have all of these choices available to me that I have today, um, and, and that's made a whole bunch of changes in there. Um, when we look at average monthly spend, for a long time it was relatively flat. We saw you know some prices increases in there, but not a lot. And a, but fast forward to, to today and moving out to 2026, we are seeing price increases. We are seeing what the average monthly spend is by consumers growing um, on an annual basis. And this is not so much because of price increases by the providers themselves, though that's part of it, but it's because people are subscribing to more services. But as they add, excuse me, as they add more and more services in there, there's trade-offs that are having to be, that are being made. And then a couple of important takeaways to this is that the idea that this one size fits all um, service or will meet everybody's needs um, is no longer the case that, that consumers have options now. The barriers to churn have been lowered, um, that there's, there's a whole host of video options out there. Um, and that consumers are looking for the services that provide, that A, provide value. Because if we looked at, if you recall, just a few moments ago, looking at that attitudinal data, there's definite questions about um, 
about whether or not consumers are, are feel like they are getting enough value from the services that they subscribe to. And clearly only about a third of them feel that they're getting value from these services. So that, 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 that tells you that a lot of these services are not necessarily aligned with the needs and the budgets of consumers, um, which means as the market continues to fragment that segmentation models become really important to understand the needs and wants of the consumer and making sure that, that your products or ser and services are aligned with those needs. Um, next slide. So, so let's continue to play this out and how this is what this looks like in the marketplace. So, first off, um, pay TV will continues to comprise the bulk of revenues. And though we see that over the top video, SVOD, et cetera, is growing and it absolutely is growing, the bulk of the revenues continue to come from um, legacy pay TV services and pay TV services. That being said, the revenues are pretty flat, um, that we're not going to see a lot of growth um, in the grand scheme of things over the course of um, the next five years. Where the revenue growth is going to come from is on the SVOD side of the marketplace and the OTT revenue. So OTT revenue is going to grow from 27% to 34% by 2026. This is where, where the growth is coming from. And what's driving this growth, if we go to the next slide, David. And what's driving this growth is subscriptions because pay TV subscriptions are going, to, are going to remain relatively flat. The number of, of SVOD subscriptions are growing dramatically. In fact, 2022 is the year that we think in Europe, um, the number of SVOD subscriptions will eclipse those of uh, pay TV providers. And that's including the virtual and PVDs in there as well. Um, so what we're getting here is that the average number of video subscriptions is growing. It's growing from 1.78 in 2021 to 2.13 2, 2 in 2026. And this is among households that subscribe to some form of subscription television. Um, but what's also important about that, because you can say we're going from 1.7 to 2.1, it's growth, but it's not um, huge growth. So there's two things that are going on in there to drive those numbers. Number one is we're having churn in there that people, because is when we see the number of subscription going up and we think back to what we saw two slides ago about household spend, they're not just it continuing to add services one on top of another on top of another on top of another and, and driving up what they're willing to pay. There clearly is when we look at those, those average spend numbers, there is a cap on what people are willing to spend. They're not just continuing to add service on top of service on top of service. So there's churn involved in there um, as they're replacing one service with another service. And clearly you wanna be among the services that are either being retained um, or being added, not one of the services that are, um, that are being cut, but that becomes a, a critical factor. And what about, so Mike, what about devices in here as well? Is it, I mean, is it, how important is this whole emergence of these new access points, new connected TV, smart TVs, in driving up some of this subscription, uh, S1 subscription yeah, numbers? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think that's a great point because that is, I guess that would be the great common denominator because that's what's opened up um, access for a lot of these services um, to gain access to the consumer. Connected TVs in particular, in particular, smart TVs have been a major driver of adoption of, um, of over-the-top video services because it gave them an opportunity for them to be able to, to reach the consumer and, and not just reach the consumer because a consumer could always get it on their laptop or on their mobile phone. But as I mentioned earlier, to be able to reach the consumer's television set because that's where they want to watch Pitch, dramas. That's where they want to watch comedies. It's one thing to be watching, you know, short form video clips on your phone. That's great. But to be able to watch, you know, movies and to be able to watch dramas and television shows, those are the things that people want to be able to watch on the television. And connected TVs and smart TVs in particular um, have opened the door um, for these services to be able to reach consumers. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think actually speaks to one of the questions we've just had in about what are the most appreciated 
devices to watch TV or video content today? Uh, will it be the same in the coming years? I think you've kind of answered that, Mike, there. I think a lot of people are shifting towards the bigger screen, the big screen in the house, the smart TV, uh, particularly for premium, long-form content. Um, of course, they're consuming internet video on, 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 on other devices as well, but when they're in the home um, and they want to watch uh, premium content, it's really the smart TV that most people are, are, um, are, 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 are moving towards uh, and away perhaps from some of these other devices. So kind of brings us back to let's talking about these devices themselves and the platforms that, that, that sit on these devices. Um, and I think we've become used um, to major tech companies dominating uh, some of these key industries after creating the platforms uh, that products and services are, are built on. So Microsoft uh, did it first in, in PCs, of course, uh, Apple and, and uh, Google and Apple dominate in, in smartphones. Uh, Amazon leads Google and Apple in, in smart speakers. But when it comes to connected TV on the right hand side here, it's, it's, it's a very different picture. Uh, and by the way, what we're looking at here is the, the, the in platform share of the install base of, of, uh, of each of those industries in, in Western Europe. Um, and so connected TV world um, is, is much more fragmented. It's, it's clearly still at the only, only, only an early stage of its evolution. Um, but we count, you know, at least um, a dozen players in there who are, who are building significant share or building a significant base of users. Um, and there's a whole host of other companies in there as well looking to fight for share. And I think the fact that it's so fragmented um, partly reflects the fact that TV has very, very different uh, user expectations uh, as well as industry structures than, than these other markets that we're talking about here. And of course, this fragmentation causes headaches, not only for the uh, content providers, but also for the app developers. Uh, if they want to maximize the uh, the potential audience, then they have to create multiple versions of, of the app to support the lengthy list of platforms uh, that, that viewers may want to use. Um, and as we've seen, this can cause delays in certain services uh, becoming available on, on, on some of these different platforms. So that creates frustration on, um, amongst the consumers as well. So I guess if we look forward and, and whether connected TV becomes as concentrated as some of these other markets. Uh, I think that's gonna be one of the key uncertainties over the next decade. Uh, I think in the short term, um, we may even see an expansion in the number of uh, platforms as, as players um, across the value chain seek a share of uh, what is a very, very lucrative TV uh, advertising and data business. Um, but longer term, I think we'd expect to see a shakedown uh, in the number of platforms. Um, I think it's unlikely that uh, the economics of, of platform partnerships, of payment systems, of app development and, and data management will, will be able to support uh, multiple systems in, in, in the long term. So why are these platforms so important um, and why do they matter? Well, I think they matter really because they, they actually already determine um, many of the key elements are, that make up a TV experience today. Um, we've seen that a lot of attention uh, in recently has focused on how these platforms can improve the, uh, the, the way that content is discovered. Um, and in particular, the fact that they offer a, an alternative to the, um, to the EPG model, which has been used by um, the, the traditional TV market for, for, for decades now. Um, but beyond this, many of the underlying elements of, of what make up a TV service are supported and are defined by these connected D TV platforms, uh, including things such as uh, streaming codecs and, and security technologies. Uh, and you know, these have already been given rise to, to um, arguments between rival players. Just last year, we saw, we saw uh, a dispute between Roku and Google over the AV1 uh, streaming codec that, that, that Google is starting to push out. Uh, and I think we can expect to see 
more of these conflicts uh, emerge as uh, previously neutral uh, TV device manufacturers start to develop their own streaming services and, and, and platforms as well. So here at Strategy Analytics, we've been, uh, we've been tracking the connected TV uh, device and platform landscape for the last 15 years um, across multiple regions, across multiple countries. Uh, our modeling suggests that um, uh, by the end of this year, more than one and a half billion connected TV uh, devices will be in use worldwide. Um, and around six platforms uh, will each have more than uh, 100 million uh, devices installed each. So if we look at you know, who's leading this market, uh, we see Samsung's, Samsung with Tizen leading the race for uh, number one in terms of devices installed. Uh, and that's really thanks to its, its strength in, 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 in global uh, TV, uh, its smart TV business. Google is, is closing fast, however, um, and seems to be getting, uh, I guess it's hacked together finally in terms of its TV strategy after you know, various attempts uh, in, in the past. And we're also seeing LG, Amazon and Roku all growing steadily as well. Uh, the latter two, I think one of the big challenges for the latter two, uh, Amazon and Roku, is going to be to expand uh, internationally, particularly as they see growth opportunities in their core US market. Uh, start to start to slow down somewhat. Um, we just we, we had a question actually interesting about how um, about smart TV vendors and and um, and smart TV and smart home ecosystems and about the relationship between smart TV and the smart home. And I think that's a really interesting question because a lot of these companies here also have their own smart home play. Um, they have their own smart home products and services, particularly Google uh, and, and and Amazon. Uh, and I think, you know, clearly um, the, the, they, they potentially see the smart TV as, as the hub um, for accessing and controlling many of those smart home devices and services around the home. And we're starting to see some moves towards that. And I think things like the new uh, Matter uh, protocol is, is only going to help strengthen the relationship between what the smart TV can do to help control um, uh, and navigate the, 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 the smart home. So we expect the smart TV to really start to um, um, improve its capabilities in, in respect to, to the smart home over the next few years. So, so David, actually, just let me add one more thing there. You, started, yeah. you touched on it closely, um, but the, the other thing is, is, is whether it's a smart TV or, or to, to car, the connected TV in general, is, is increasingly an access point for, um, for consumers to be able to get the services that they want, whether it's Netflix, whether it's, it's Hulu, um, regardless, um, or, or even for, for fast services, particularly for, and, and this is particularly relevant for, for cord cutters or cord nevers. If you wanna reach these people, the connected TV gives you the ability to do so. Um, and this changes the relationship as, as David mentioned, um, that, that we have seen conflicts between the connected TV platforms and, and, and programmers and, and content owners as they're negotiating the rights fees. You know, we, we've seen, um, We've seen these fights historically between pay TV providers and programmers. Now these same sorts of conflicts are beginning to show up with more regularity um, between CTV platforms and, and the programmers as well. Um, you know, HBO was had when they originally rolled out HBO Max. Where, you know, there were some issues of whether on route, whether or not they're going to be on Roku or Amazon Fire or um, or. Uh, um, or Apple TV. Just yesterday, I was seeing that when CNN Plus rolls out later this month in the US, it's currently not going to be available on um, Roku devices. And all of these things affect the addressable market. And it, it's, it's creating, and there's new points of leverage that we're seeing as we move forward. So I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, no, thanks, Mike. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, and we did have another quick question, actually. I'll bring this up now. Um, isn't the smart TV at the end just a big screen? It's a display to watch content. Doesn't the customer prefer to uh, prefer the device or the platform with the best UX? Um, 
and and joy of use to stream his services to the screen, no matter whether the streaming device is a TV set, a, a digital streamer, or game console. And I think I think that's right. I think you know, at the end of the day, consumers want simplicity. They want the best experience, the fastest way to access the content. And I think increasingly we're seeing smart TVs improve so that they can offer a comparable experience to the, that that we've seen on media streamers and potentially game consoles as well in the in the past. And I think the the thing that's drawing consumers more towards smart TV is 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 the convenience, the convenience factor that you don't have to switch between HDMI's or, or different devices. You just switch the TV on. It's one user interface, one remote control. Um, and you can access, um, you know, all of that content through that 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 interface without having um, to to swap between different devices, and um, and and so I think that convenience factor is 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 a big point. That's not to say that smart TVs don't don't have their faults. There are clearly um, you know lots of improvements to to be made, um, um, but you know I think as these operating systems become more stable and um, we start to see manufacturers supporting them for a longer length of time with regular updates, um, then, then the performance certainly is, is, is improving. Um, moving on, I wanted to touch a little bit also about what we talked about before, the fact that traditional TV players have been, I guess, initially slow to respond to the rising consumption of streaming video by consumers. But now we're starting to see an, an acceleration in terms of their response to the, the emergence of these new distribution channels and, and, and the fact that consumer behavior is changing as well. And I think a high profile example of this recently is Sky UK's launch of its Sky Glass product um, in the UK, which promises to be, um, I guess, a game changing uh, technology for the industry and, and certainly a significant shift in strategy from, from Sky. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of what it is, but backed by Comcast's global um, technology platform, Sky Glass is, is essentially an, um, an IP-only delivered Sky TV service built directly into Sky's own branded uh, smart TVs. So essentially doing, the way, doing away with the need for a, a, a satellite dish or, or a peripheral box, set-top box. So what this does, interestingly, is put Sky in direct competition with the smart TV manufacturers but also the platform uh, guys such as Roku, Amazon, and Google, who are in many ways Sky's future competition in, in this business, uh, and who, like Sky, are, are looking to become super aggregators uh, in this new streaming world. And I think, um, you know, it's a fascinating move by Sky. It comes at a time when, as Mike's described, pay TV customers are re-evaluating their relationship with their TV providers. Core cutting is, of course, becoming more prevalent. Um, that's not to say that Skyglass is designed as a replacement for Sky's top of the line Sky Q box, at, at least not at the moment. Um, and, and I don't think the company has any intention of, of cannibalizing its Sky Q customer base. But certainly Sky hopes that it, with this product, it can help to expand its household reach into homes that see value in a relatively low cost all-in-one solution that brings together all of the content that they want to watch in a, in a seamless manner. Um, but it's also a platform for Comta Comcast to expand its footprint uh, internationally uh, by deploying the technology via partnerships uh, with other telco and, and subscription TV operators around the world. And we've already seen Foxtel in Australia uh, commit to that and, and they will be launching Skyglass TVs running a Foxtel streaming service uh, in, in 2023. But I think most importantly, what this does is give Sky control over the main user interface of the TV, rather than having to battle for HDMI sockets with, with other pieces of hardware. So Sky's UI is up front, it's center, every time you turn on the TV, uh, and even if owners of the TV uh, stop subscribing to that Sky service, Sky will retain control over the TV's influence uh, interface and, and, and potentially the, the ad sales as well. Um, and, and how Sky is retailing its product as well is, is, is unique in itself, offering three different sizes, um, offering the option of paying for the set in monthly installments. Um, and it brings a whole host of other benefits as, as you know, listed here as well, from universal search through voice, uh, integrated speakers and, and subwoofer, which removes the, the need to have a separate soundbar. Of course, a wide range of content partners 
and targeted advertising. Um, you know, this has multiple implications for Sky Media, which is Sky's uh, in-house um, sales house. Uh, and again, moving all of the, uh, the, 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 the solution to an IP delivered solution means that all of that content on Sky Glass essentially can be targeted with, with advertising. Um, and so I think, you know, brings us on to advertising. It brings us on to the importance that connected TV advertising ha is, has. Uh, it has the potential to reach groups of TV viewers that uh, traditional advertising can't. Uh, and Mike's going to talk very, very briefly, I think, a little bit about why, you know, connected TV advertising is, is so exciting, I think, for, for many of the in the TV industry. Yeah, so, so, so let me first start by, by giving you just a quick definition because um, oftentimes when I have these conversations that, that CTV advertising and digital advertising, traditional television advertising, they sort of, what, what are these things? So we define connected TV as for advertising as video delivered to connected streaming devices such as smart TV, streaming media devices, et cetera. It differs from, say, over-the-top video advertising or digital advertising, which refers to video delivered to services such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Paramount, Pluto TV, et cetera. And even within in the over-the-top category, we have has sort of subsets there, such as, as Netflix, which is pure play subscription, versus Pluto TV, um, which would be an ad supported service versus say a Paramount Plus or an HBO Max, which is a hybrid, meaning they have both ad supported and th their subscription services that are ad supported and subs subscription services that have no ads to them. So th there's a whole host of, 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 um, of models that are available um, on the advertising side. Um, but one thing we, we know about is that connected TV advertising is growing by leaps and bounds. If we look at it at, at connected TV ad spend in the US, which at this point is probably the most developed market out there, um, we see that, that it's already a um, almost a $14 billion business in 2020, 2021, and that's going to grow to a $28 billion business um, by 2025. This is not an inconsequential market. And one of the and things that are driving this is just the growth of, of addressable television sets and addressable and, and, um, and CTV households. So that strategy analytics estimates that in, that in 2021, that there are about 99 million connected TV households in the US. According to SpotX, in Europe's biggest markets, there are nearly 62 million CTV households. Clearly, they, they, these are, the, um, the the addressable market of CTV households is growing by leaps and bounds and it's creating opportunities for advertisers to reach these services. And it's creating opportunities for, um, for ad-based services like Pluto TV to be able to participate significantly in this revenue stream. And, and in fact, they are, um, and then they're cannibalizing legacy TV revenues as advertisers are shifting their ad dollars from um, legacy programmers and, and legacy broadcasters and networks over to these over-the-top um, AVOD services. And, and, and it makes sense because CTV offers advertisers a number of advantages. Um, we're talking about data-driven targeted advertising um, that... Um, on, on CTV, that it is as cord cutting um, continues to grow, it enables advertisers to reach these cord cutters, which they can't do through traditional media. Um, unlike what we see in, in a lot in, in more in the OTT video world or the digital video world, the CTV ads can't be skipped, so completion rates are higher. Um, we also see um, that that it that brand by being on CTV and being associated with higher quality content with movies with TV shows it helps to drive brand recognition for the ads um, and and finally as every advertiser will tell you um, that that they appreciate the fact that um, CTV ads are less expensive than linear TV ads, though it should be noted that they're still not, um, not as cheap as those that you'll find on um, OTD video services. Now, all that being said, that CTV is not perfect. Um, 
that ad, unlike what you'll find on web ads, CTV ads are not clickable. Um, and you're only reaching CTV viewers, which is not um, all viewers. So, so linear, traditional linear still needs to be part of that ad mix. It's not a, it's not a replacement. It's really um, that at this point in time, at least advertisers need to be in both places. So next slide, David. Um, so, so if we think of, as we start to, to want to wrap things up here, as we think about the implications for, for broadcasters and programmers, I think it's, it's really about striking a balance and managing the decline of the legacy business and growing your new opportunities and how you can transition customers to these new um, customer relationship business models. You know, I think Two who are doing a particularly good job of this is um, of Disney with their transition from, from legacy products to their direct consumer and also Paramount as they continue to grow their streaming business. For, o for OTT video services, um, it's about evolving global strategies. Um, and, and I think, as I mentioned, I mentioned them earlier, I think a great example of this is Nordic Entertainment Group with what they're doing with their Via Play. They started out as a, as a very much a regional player um, in, um, in, in the Scandinavian countries. And they're now branching out to Western Europe. They're branching out to Eastern Europe. They are coming to the United States. They are looking to become a, gro a global player. And, and how do you do this? Um, how do you become and join the global players um, while not sacrificing what you've already established as a regional player? For service providers, it, it's about exploring new partnerships um, with, with a whole host of, of new, um, new entities. And it's about, I would argue, it's largely about aggregation of these over-the-top video services into and how do you effectively do this? Are you going to build them um, yourselves? Are you going to partner with third parties um, to be able to, to help you integrate these into your service and to be able to aggregate them? Um, and discovering the most profitable alternatives there, there's a whole host of, of services that are available. Um, the last time we did a count on Roku in the U.S., there were over 2,500 services um, free and paid on Roku that are available. That, that is, quite frankly, it, it's, it's an unmanageable amount from a consumer, um, but identifying which ones are the most profitable and which ones do you want to make partnerships are, are an important part of, of identifying um, who you want to aggregate. Um, and that, that applies to which are the ones that are going to appeal to which segments of the market. So it's not a one size fits all strategy anymore, um, but rather um, it, it's about consumer choice and identifying those that are going to appeal to different segments of the market. Yeah, and I just add to that on the on the service provider point here, and then thinking about pay TV operators who've historically um, owned the platform that TV services are delivered through in the shape of the set top box. Now, as that set top box functionality starts to become integrated into the TV itself, where does that leave the pay TV operator? Um, do they risk losing their status as as the aggregator of choice? Should they build their own TV like Sky Comcast are doing, as we've seen? Uh, can they make the, the whole operator as an app model emerge as a viable uh, option to replace their, their set-top box um, business? So there's, there's, there's lots of questions, I think, that uh, you know, uh, pay TV operators are, are grappling with. And then from a TV, a CTV vendor perspective, um, you know, suddenly the smart TV vendors themselves are in a position of power. Uh, having historically been, um, I guess, passive players in, 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 the, in the TV ecosystem. Uh, so those that have built their own uh, platforms, uh, the likes of Samsung and LG, you know, potentially stand, stand to open up very significant new revenue um, um, streams through advertising and, and other, uh, other media. Uh, and I guess the question then becomes to other smart TV vendors, should they pursue this course? Do they risk becoming irrelevant if they, um, as, particularly as a consumer facing brand, if they don't? Do the likes of Samsung and LG have enough scale to go it alone longer term? Uh, or, or will TV start to mirror the, the, the PC and, and, and mobile markets as we, as we saw before? So lots and lots of questions, I think, outstanding. 
Um, so that kind of draws around the, the, the actual presentation. I think in summary, we've, we've talked about the, the transformation of, of TV, um, how, it's, how it's happening rapidly, how connected TV platforms are, are growing in importance um, and are likely to be at the heart of the TV experience for, for, for years to come. Of course, there are many unanswered questions. There's countless challenges ahead. Um, you know, but we, we, we firmly believe there's, there's, there's an enormous amount of opportunity out there for players who are in, ready to embrace uh, the, the changes ahead. So I think um, we, we're kind of up against time, but we've, we've perhaps got time to, to take a, a few of the questions. And apologies if we don't get to all of them, but we will make sure we, we follow up um, after the call. Um, Mike, perhaps a quick one for you. Um, how important do you think AVOD, such as Pluto, is in creating value, uh, be that ad revenue loyalty for, for CTV platforms? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. And I, and I think it, it, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's a topic unto itself. But um, I think the short answer is AVOD is very important. Not everybody wants to to pay for television. Not everybody wants to subscribe to services. Not everybody wants to subscribe to Netflix or Amazon or Disney or, or any of these services. Um, and um, it, it varies by, by country, but we certainly see in Europe, pay TV um, penetration has historically not been as high as that in the US, for example. Um, and these AVOD services um, fill a need. And, and for, for people who don't necessarily want to subscribe, and even for people who do want to subscribe to pay channels, they also provide need. If they're providing different content, um, and so they are cre they're creating value for themselves and for the platforms that they're partnered with. Um, they're generating revenue for, for themselves and for the platforms that they're on. And I think the key for them is, is like everything, it's, it's about we're, we're, continue, we're continuing to see the Plutos of the world and others and, and the, the Peacocks of the world develop original content. Um, it's standing out um, and being able to to have content that people want to see. And, and I've said this several times already today, but I'm going to stress this point is the need to segment the market because, and, and this is one of the things that I think AVOD services are, are doing well is they're identifying segments of the market that are underserved. Um, and this particularly applies at least to smaller AVOD services, not necessarily the Plutos of the world, um, but they're identifying segments of the market that are underserved and providing content to them. Um, and, and that provides a tremendous amount of value to the consumer. Cool, thanks, Mike. Um, a couple of other questions here. Why is Android TV growing faster than others, such as uh, Amazon and Roku? That's a great question. The data, I mean, the data we were showing there was um, some of it was European, some of it was global, and I guess it depends on the, the country and the region we're looking at. But, but Andrew, Android TV or Google TV, um, as it's been rebranded to for the, for the smart TVs, um, you know, is getting a lot of momentum. That's really down to um, the number of um, partnerships that, that, that Google is building with TV OEMs um, and, um, you know, transitioning a lot of those, those TVs to the new Google TV platform. Um, we're starting to see some brands like TCL, which has almost exclusively um, been a, um, a Roku brand in the US in terms of it, it, it's been using Roku for its smart TV platform uh, in, in the US market, now starting to offer some Android TV models as well. Um, um, and, and, and we're seeing, you know, certainly the number of OEM partners start to grow internationally. I think that's, that's one of the issues that Amazon and, 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 and to a greater extent Roku have is that their core market is the US um, and Roku particularly has perhaps struggled to, to really expand rapidly outside of that core US market. They're doing very well in Canada, starting to really develop, um, develop its share in, in, in Latin America. Uh, and has recently entered the German market, has been in the UK for a, for, for a number of years, but you know its share is, is, is very, very low in the European market com compared to uh, some of the more established players in that region. Uh, so on a global level, certainly Android is, 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 really, uh, is, is, is really catching up quickly. Um, 
Other question, are these, does this data also include other streaming devices such as Google, Chromecast, dongles, Fire TV sticks? Yes, when we talk about connected TV devices, we talk about smart TVs, uh, media streaming sticks and dongles and game consoles. Uh, and so yes, that, that data we presented there uh, about the device install base is, is those three devices combined. Um, let's see, I think we've got time for a couple more. David, how do you rate the uh, customer's acceptance of products like Sky Glass uh, being not established TV manuf manufacturer, even if the idea product is really good? Um, I think that's, that's a great question. I think the, the jury is still out on how successful the, the Sky Glass product will be. Um, it's obviously very, very early days. Um, and, um, and it's a new business model, you know, con consumers having the ability to, to pay in, in monthly installments is new and, and may well be very attractive to a, to a number of, uh, a number of consumers. Um, hey, hey, David, go ahead, Mike. To, yeah. Just to add to that, this isn't really so much of a connected TV, um, comment, but it was actually just reported, um, yesterday that actually, um, Apple is starting to look at this subscription model as well for their products, for phones, for Apple TV, well, Apple TV would be relevant here, but, but for Apple hardware as well, they're starting to explore the idea of a sub subscription model. So, so you can start to see how this might start to, um, percolate out to other, other vendors other than just, um, Sky, Sky Glass. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think it depends on the, on the experience. You know, I don't think necessarily consumers are building shrines to, um, you know, their favorite consumer electronics brand anymore. It's, it's, it's about the experience, about the platform, the services that they're, they're getting. Uh, and, and clearly Sky does deliver that um, very, very well indeed. They've got a track record of delivering excellence. I think it's also uh, about giving consumers... Yeah, it's also about giving consumers choice here that you're not necessarily that historically, you know, you, you typically walk into a, a retailer or order something online, you pay for it, and you're done with it. Um, that 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 I think you're starting to see um, consumer electronics manufacturers just looking at other mo other potential business models, giving consumers other ways they could possibly pay for devices um, and, and expand their, their market penetration. Exactly, exactly. So I think we've probably run out of time. We're reaching the top of the hour, but um, I think there are a few other questions. We, we do promise we'll get back to you uh, if we haven't managed to get to your question. But um, let me just quickly take the opportunity to thank everyone for listening. Um, don't hesitate to get in touch with uh, either myself or Mike if you have any other questions or want to learn any more about how what strategy analytics is, is doing in this space. Um, so but thanks a lot again for listening, everyone. Thank you very much. It was fascinating and fabulous slides as well. And it proves everybody found it a fascinating subject because everybody's still on. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, fabulous questions as well the two emails are there if you have any more questions or if you want to email us directly it's info at ctameurope.com so thanks again David thanks Michael and to Strategy Analytics I said it right for um, their partnership as well so thank you everyone and our next webinar is in three weeks because of the, the Easter break. I almost said Christmas then because of the Easter break. So thank you both. Thanks everybody for attending and send the questions if you have any. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.